Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. Sing, Unburied Sing begins with death, in all its stench, in all its slime, in all its bloody viscera, as 13-year-old Jojo assists his grandfather in the slaughter, skinning and freezing of a goat. It's an aroma that hangs in the air, and one that Jasmine Ward never fully allows to lift, as she leads readers into her exquisitely written third novel, and to borrow from Margaret Atwood, into the not-buried heart of the American nightmare. Achingly lyrical and steeped enough in the traditions of the road novel for Time magazine to hail Ward as the heir to Faulkner, Sing Unburied Sing also succeeds in being sufficiently mould-breaking and painfully contemporary for the Times of London to declare it a harrowing essential novel for our times. Our guides are the aforementioned Jojo, on the cusp of adulthood and beset with all the uncertainties that entails, particularly for a young African-American. Jojo's mother, Leone, and... A third voice, so striking and unconventional that I'll let Jasmine decide whether and how we talk about it this evening. Sing Unburied Sing drives us through the torrid Mississippi countryside, but also traverses the potholed political landscape of contemporary America, engaging with questions of racism, of poverty, of incarceration, of drug addiction, and the points at which they explosively intersect. It's a testament to Jasmine Ward's consummate skill as a storyteller and a miraculous gift for language that a novel so rich with ideas, so steeped in history, is also such a compelling and affecting read. Jasmine Ward received her MFA from the University of Michigan and has received the MacArthur Genius Grant, a Stegner Fellowship, a John and Rennie Grisham Writer's Residency and the Strauss Living Prize. She's the first female author to win, the na to win two National Book Awards for Fiction, for Salvage the Bones in 2011 and last year, of course, for Sing Unburied Sing. She's also the editor of the anthology The Fire This Time, the author of the mem memoir Men We Reaped, and the novel Where the Line Bleeds. She's currently an associate professor of creative writing at Tulane University and lives in Mississippi. In addition to the National Book Awards, Sing Unburied Sing was selected as a book of the year by the New York Times, the New Statesman, the Financial Times, the New York Times Book Review, Time and the BBC, and just this week was shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction. Sing Unbury Sing stirred Anne Patchett to declare Jasmine Ward one of the most important writers in America today. It also featured on what's become one of the hottest lists in literature after being chosen as one of the best books of 2017 by President Barack Obama. Please join me in welcoming Jasmine Ward to Shakespeare and Company. And I think we're going to open tonight with a reading from the beginning of the book. Okay. Chapter 1, Jojo. I like to think I know what death is. I like to think that it's something I could look at straight. When Pop tell me he need my help and I see that black knife slid into the belt of his pants, I follow Pop out the house, try to keep my back straight, my shoulders even as a hanger. That's how Pop walks. I try to look like this is normal and born so Pop will think I've earned these 13 years. So Pop will know I'm ready to pull what needs to be pulled. Separate innards from muscles, organs from cavities. I want Pop to know I can get bloody. Today's my birthday. I grab the door so it don't slam, ease it into the jam. I don't want Ma'am or Kayla to wake up with none of us in the house. Better for them to sleep. Better for my little sister Kayla to sleep because on nights when Leonie's out working, she wake up every hour, sit straight up in the bed and scream. Better for Grandma Ma'am to sleep because the chemo done dried her up and hollered her out the way the sun and the air do water oaks. Pop weaves in and out of the trees, straight and slim and brown as a young pine tree. He spits in the dry red dirt and the wind makes the trees wave. It's cold. This spring is stubborn. Most days it won't make way for warmth. The chill stays like water in a bad draining tub. I left my hoodie on the floor in Leone's room where I sleep, and my t-shirt is thin, but I don't rub my arms. If I let the cold goad me, I know when I see the goat, I'll flinch or frown when Pop cuts the throat. And Pop, being Pop, will see. Thank you so much. I mentioned in the introduction the... Um the way that, that the opening to the book, uh, to a certain extent, sets the tone a little bit of what we're to expect. And it's actually, it's a very bold opening in one respect. I think you you ask a, a lot of your reader, in a way, to sort of, uh, you confront them with the, um, not just the, the concept of death, but very vivid descriptions of, um, of what death involves. I mean, in this case, to a goat, but it's not much of a a mental leap to uh, to project that onto other mammals, including humans. Um, and I was just wondering uh, why you took that decision to to begin the book with such uh, such a bold image. 
Um, so I always like to begin with a strong image in the same way that I like to end with a strong image too. Um, you know, I think that um, you know that that the beginning, the very beginning, has to do so much, right? It has to make the re reader want to continue reading. Um, it has to grip the reader, it has to, has to hook the reader, but it also has to give the reader some indication of what, you know, the big ideas or the driving um, force or the driving theme behind the book is. And because I knew that this would be a book, I figured it was it would be a book about death um, from the very beginning of the of the of the rough draft. That's why I decided I wanted to open with the death. Um, I was also thinking about Salvage the Bones, which is my second novel. And I was thinking about the way that that novel opened with life, with birth, right? And so I thought, okay, so it's only right here, um, you know, because I'm writing about death and because I've already, you know, written about birth, it's, it's right for me to start um, with, uh, you know, with this moment, right? With this slaughter of this animal that's going to feed this family. Um, and, and that's going to, I don't know, to give, you know, Jojo is a very deprived child in, in many respects. And so, you know, it, there's this, the, the death of the goat is this moment of great violence, but it's also, you know, what is behind that violence is a certain tenderness and a certain kindness and a certain caring. And that slaughter is almost an expression of love from Pop, right, for his grandson. And so, I don't know, I get, I, I wanted to, uh, I guess to hint at that too, uh -huh. in, in, in opening with the goat, and it also feels um, because it's JoJo's birthday, and because he's at this very precise age of, of thirteen, like almost like a rite of passage. Mm -hmm. In fact, like it's the beginning of his uh, of his transition mm -hmm. um, into adulthood, mm -hmm. um, and JoJo certainly. Um, so most of the book is told either from the perspective of JoJo or Leone, and this third voice, which we'll discuss mm -hmm. later. Um, so the the family is you have Jojo, then you have his mother Leonie, mm -hmm. then you have Leonie's uh, parents. Mm -hmm. um, when you when you conceived of this family and this uh, this story you mm -hmm. wanted to tell, was it always obvious to you which voices you would tell it through that it would be Jojo and Leonie? Mm. I I knew from I found Jojo first, right? So I found his character first when I was casting about for novel ideas. He popped into my head, and he and he he, he was a thirteen year old mixed race mixed race boy, um, growing up uh, through like very difficult circumstances, and and that was true of him from the beginning. I wasn't sure what the circumstances would be, you know, the specifics of the circumstances, um, but but I knew that he was going through a rough time right and that that and that he was in some respects a child being made to bear adult burdens i just wasn't sure what exactly what those burdens would be um so i knew that his voice was important from the very beginning but i did want other um characters to be able to narrate their own sections at first you know i was i thought well, maybe I'll have, you know, three or four or five, but I decided <laughs> that I should focus um, and that the other first person point of view should be his mother's. But it took me a while to figure out who Leone was as a character. Like at first I didn't realize she was black. I thought she would be white. At first I thought that he, he would have, you know, that Jojo would have multiple siblings so she would have m multiple children. Um, and, uh, you know, she wasn't always uh, struggling with uh, addiction, right? Um, she wasn't always as, uh, I guess, as abusive as she as she is in the book. Um, but I had to sort of, I don't know, I, I had to figure out some of that before I began. Mm -hmm. um, and then I learned more about her as I went. And I didn't actually commit to writing chapters from Richie's perspective, and Richie is the ghost. Um, I didn't actually commit to writing chapters from his perspective until somewhere between the 13th and the 15th revision hmm. and only at the suggestion of my editor okay. who said have you ever thought about writing you know a, a chapter or chapters from Richie's perspective and I had I thought about it when I discovered Richie as a character mm -hmm. but I think I was afraid to do so mm -hmm. and so when my editor asked me whether or not I was I had thought about doing so it was as if 
she she it was as if it was a vote of confidence mm. from her saying oh you can you yeah. can do that so then I tried it and indeed I know that's um, a practice some writers go to even if they're not planning on including it in the book mm. just to get to know a mm-hmm. character in fact mm-hmm. to write from their perspective and find out things about them they mm. they didn't particularly uh, realize that they that they knew mm. just resting with with jojo for a moment mm-hmm. um the way you described him as um you know you said he came he came to you first mm-hmm. and you knew he was in a difficult situation mm-hmm. he was a a young mixed race mm-hmm. boy the way the way you described him it sounded almost like you could have been describing a more general situation mm-hmm. of um of young mixed mm-hmm. race boys or mm-hmm. teenage mixed race boys mm-hmm. or black boys in the united states mm-hmm. generally and mm-hmm. i was wondering was the character of jojo born out of this kind of increasing uh uh sort of news stories about sort of young black boys mm-hmm. for example being being shot by police mm-hmm. being sort of gunned down and be getting this kind of um discriminatory treatment in their lives mm-hmm. in general um i don't know if it's if if his character came to me for those reasons necessarily i don't know i mean i've been writing about younger characters for a while in my fiction um you know both in my novels and and in my published and unpublished short fiction um so yeah so i don't know if 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 there's like a direct correlation between the two i do know that i was um you know that that i was very aware of um you know of 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 all the you know black men and black women and black children that were being killed um you know while i was sort of casting about for ideas uh when i began you know when i wanted to begin writing this book i think that's one of the reasons why i knew from the very beginning that they and i don't mean to spoil things but th- a policeman does show up mm-hmm. um sometime during the story mm-hmm. and there's a there's a very tense moment mm-hmm. So and I will I'd like to talk about that a little bit later actually but um you mentioned um writing about younger characters mm-hmm. um and that's interesting because Leonie um despite being Jojo's mother mm-hmm. um there's a certain I don't know if youthfulness is the word or mm-hmm. immaturity but mm-hmm. there's something uh in in the Jojo he's sort of on the cusp of sort of turning into mm-hmm. an adult Leonie is almost uh she's an adult she's of adult age but at the same time there's something almost childlike about her or certainly certainly immature mm-hmm. yeah leonie's you know she's somewhere in her mid 20s um i am horrible at math so i can't tell you off the top of my head exactly how old she is but i worked it out while i was writing the book <laughs> um she you know i think part of the reason that that readers might get that impression of her and i think that it's a totally legitimate um impression but i think part of the reasons that readers might feel that and think that about leone is because she's carrying so many traumas from her childhood and from her adolescence with her as an adult and um you know and she hasn't uh she hasn't figured out how to live with them as a healthy adult and so she's i think she's stuck um you know and she's uh you know and and i think the the fact that she's carrying all those traumas around uh affects her behavior with her parents with her children you know with her struggle with addiction um so yeah so i think that that's why like readers would feel that she's that she's younger because in a way i mean you know her grief at losing her brother her 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 belief that she has you know disapp- continuously like disappointed her parents with the decisions the private decisions that she's made in her life i mean i think that that you know and those things happened when she was a teenager so i think that those things still you know she uh she can't sit with the pain of them so she can't figure out how to live with them in healthy ways as an adult mm-hmm. so she's really stuck mm-hmm. perhaps we could hear a little extract sure from leone so this is um from a section where uh leone is talking about her brother given uh who was uh killed um when he was a teenager he was murdered uh, on a like on a hunting trip right and the uh boy that killed him the white boy that killed him who is a cousin of michael's her baby's father was never held accountable for given's death right and whenever leone gets high i mean because she is struggling with addiction she uses coke she uses meth um and she uses other drugs 
she sees given she sees a phantom of her brother three years ago i did a line and saw given for the first time it wasn't my first line but michael had just gone to jail I had started doing it often. Every other day I was bending over a table, sifting powder into lines, inhaling. I knew I shouldn't have. I was pregnant, but I couldn't help wanting to feel the coat go up my nose, shoot straight to my brain, and burn up all the sorrow and despair I felt at Michael being gone. The first time Given showed up, I was at a party in the kill, and my brother walked through there with no bullet holes in his chest or in his neck, whole and long-limbed like always, but not smirking. <coughs> He was shirtless and red about the neck and face like he'd been running, but his chest was still a stone. Still as he must have been after Michael's cousin shot him. I thought about Mama's little forest, the ten trees she'd planted in an ever-widening spiral on every death day. I ground my gums sore staring at Given. I ate him with my eyes. He tried to talk to me, but I couldn't hear him, and he just got more and more frustrated. He sat on the table in front of me, right on the mirror with the coke on it. I couldn't put my face in it again without putting it in his lap, so we sat there staring at each other, me trying not to react so I wouldn't look crazy to my friends, who were singing along to country music, kissing sloppily in corners like teenagers, walking in zigzags with their arms linked out into the dark. Given looked at me like he did when we were little, and I broke the new fishing pole Pop got him. Murderous. When I came home, I mean when I came down, I almost ran out to my car. I was shaking so hard I could hardly put my key in the ignition. Given climbed next to me, sat in the passenger seat, and turned and looked at me with a face of stone. I quit, I said. I swear I won't do it no more. He rode with me to the house, and I left him sitting in the passenger seat as the sun softened and lit the edges of the sky, rising. I crept into Mama's bedroom and watched her sleep. Dusted her shrine, her rosary draped over her Virgin Mary statue in the corner, nestled among blue-gray blue candles, river rocks, three dried cattails, a single yam. When I saw Given Not Given for the first time, I didn't tell my mama nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think a, a book that, as you said earlier, um, is determined to engage with the, the subject of death mm -hmm. In a sense, there's an inevitability that ghosts mm. will be a part of that. But mm. what, what form those ghosts take mm. um, could, could be wide and varied. I mean, mm. of course, there's, there's ghosts as a sort of, a, as, a, as a metaphor. There's mm. ghosts as uh, visions, but which the author might specifically make clear are mm. just that, mm. visions. Um, and then there are ghosts that have... I was going to say corporeal existence, but it's not exactly that, but mm -hmm. ghosts that have a real, mm -hmm. um, literal existence mm -hmm. um, in the plot. And one of the things uh, I think you do so brilliantly in Sing Unburied Sing is, uh, is play with these, these different distinctions, mm -hmm. in fact. So here we have um, Leonie, who sees her uh, brother as mm -hmm. part of what might be dismissed as a drug-induced mm -hmm. vision. Mm -hmm. And yet... As the book progresses, we realise that the ghosts are much more, much more present and much mm -hmm. more real than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm just curious to oh. hear about sort of your 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 approach <laughs> yeah. to to ghosts and your writing. Um, so I really wasn't committed to writing a ghost story when I began seeing Unburied Sing. I, I mean, I knew that um, you know that there would be a, an element of magical realism, I guess, to to this story uh, from the very beginning I knew that Jojo could um, sort of uh, you know look at animals and be around animals and and understand what they were trying to communicate to him I knew that Leone was seeing a phantom but in the in the first draft she was actually seeing a phantom of Michael and she wasn't seeing a phantom of her brother it wasn't until I mean I I also one of the things that I knew at the very beginning of the of the rough draft was that these characters were heading to Parchment Prison to pick Michael up, right? And I knew nothing about Parchment Prison, so I started doing research about the prison. Um, you know, the Parchment Prison Farm is in the Delta. It's the Mississippi State. You know, the like I think it's the biggest you know prison in Mississippi. Um, it was I think the first. Um, big, you know, state prison in Mississippi, um, and it has a really 
uh, horrible, violent history. Um, you know, it was uh, it was uh, only established, you know, sometime during the you know late 1800s, early 1900s. I wish I could remember the date, um, but it from the beginning the sort of lawmakers in the state like once the prison was was built the lawmakers in the state decided to actually change the laws so that things like loitering was criminalized right um so that they knew that they could get a large population of black male inmates right by changing these laws and tailoring these laws so that you know so that these were the people who would you know who they could stock the prison with right and so in the be- in the beginning what they did is they rented these uh men and boys out to industrial barons in the region right and so the men and boys would like lay tracks for railroads they would um clear vast uh tracks of forest while they were chained to each other um the and and so they did a lot of that in the in the very beginning and then i don't know somewhere around the 30s they decided um that parchment prison basically would be a working plantation and that's what they made it into um the you know the inmates were made to work in work in the fields um before dawn and after you know b- throughout the day and then only ended after dusk um if they did not harvest quickly enough they were whipped with a whip called black betty um they were sometimes killed if they tried to escape they were hunted with dogs um if, if some of the inmates were actually made into guards so these guards would stand at the edge, edges of the fields and they would watch the inmates as they were, you know, uh, you know, working right in the fields. And if one of the inmates tried to escape and one of these inmate guards, you know, shot, um, you know, the, 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 the inmate who was trying to escape, then that inmate guard would be set free. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter what he'd done to end up in parchment, but he would be set free. And so, so I learned all that, and then I learned that that black boys as young as twelve were charged with things like loitering, right, and were sent to parchment prison. And as soon as I found out that that children like that existed, and that I knew nothing about them, um, and that they essentially, you know, their their lives and their pain had been basically erased from history. I knew that I had to write about write a character like that, like Richie. But I wanted him, you know, that character to have the agency, you know, and 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 um, and, and and that he was denied during his life. And I wanted him to be able to interact with JoJo, to interact with all the you know all the characters in the present. And the only way that I could accomplish that was by making him into a ghost. So that's how. You know the, the uh, you know the a ghost became a major character in my book, and then once I realized Richie was a ghost, I thought back to you know this phantom that Leone was seeing, and I mm-hmm. thought, well, that phantom Michael is not doing any work in the narrative, so he might as well be a ghost too. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and then and then I made him into a ghost. So it was really like you know the I guess the you know the horrific things that I learned about Mississippi and uh, Parchman Prison and. and 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 history that made me uh, feel compelled to create mm-hmm. these ghosts. And also, um, I find it very interesting that you talk about the subject of agency as well. So, the sort of this uh, Richie couldn't just be a figment of JoJo's imagination mm-hmm. in order to for the character mm-hmm. to have agency, to have a certain dignity. Mm-hmm. He needed to to exist independently yeah. of uh, of um, of JoJo. Mm-hmm. Um, I think another thing that that go- using ghosts in a narrative allows you to do is to give this kind of sense of a sort of collapse of time mm-hmm. in a way and to show that um, history rather than being one event progressing to another event progressing to another event and something that let's say you know 100, 150 years separate are not particularly relevant to each other it allows you to sort of to overlap mm-hmm. layers of history and to, to draw parallels mm-hmm. between um, the way things are now and the way things were in Richie's day and mm-hmm. and, and also um, previously. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just thought that was... Th- it, it really interested me as well from the perspective of the the oral storytelling mm-hmm. tradition as well because um, obviously the, the three 
characters we meet it's all first person mm -hmm. um narratives and um yeah I, I just i'd just be interested to hear a little bit more about your your approach to uh to, to oral storytelling like why it was uh, first person narratives and and just to talk a little bit about the the different layers of of history hmm. um let's see so first person writing in the first person is easier for me um I, I think that one of the reasons that it's easier for me to write in the first person is because uh, when I write in the third person, I'm just very conscious of the fact that I am making all the choices, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it makes it makes the process of writing um, more tortured, and also it makes that process go very slowly, right? Because I'm constantly second, I'm, I'm get, I'm you know, second guessing every line, every word, you know, every bit of punctuation. Um, be because I'm so self-conscious about what I, that I am doing this, I'm creating this. Mm -hmm. And I think it, at least in my writing, that it makes my writing weaker because there's a certain distance then, I think. Um, so when, once I found, once I wrote my f first sh uh, short story that was in the first person and I was like oh this is great I'm staying right here <laughs> so so then I was like so then I that's basically what I did it, it just it felt more natural to me it felt um, organic to me it felt as if these characters you know the characters um, whose I guess voice I was inhabiting right these voices I was inhabiting it felt as if you know each of these characters as I wrote their first person section it felt as if they were right here mm -hmm. and they were talking to me right and I'm sort of listening and just you know channeling mm -hmm. them um, so it felt uh, I guess a bit more effortless mm -hmm. right and uh, and I was just sort of less I was less aware of myself um, and and two, I think that there's value in ha in having characters speak from a first person point of view, um, especially when you're writing about people who have traditionally been silenced. Mm -hmm. And the kind of people that I write about have traditionally been silenced. You know, their voices have not been a part of uh, you know of 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 the narrative. Um, you know, in the United States, right? Whether I'm writing from, you know, 15-year-old pregnant black poor teenager, right, and salvage the bones, or if I'm writing from, you know, a, a drug-addicted, um, you know, abusive, you know, 20-something-year-old mother who neglects her children, or if I, you know, I'm writing about a 13, you know, year old boy, right, who's trying to understand what it means to be a man and what it means to be a human being in the modern South, right? I mean, these are people that we don't hear from mm -hmm. and that have, uh, you know, traditionally just been ig been ignored. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so that's why I think I'm comfortable with the first person. Mm -hmm. And just to return to the, the subject of history, because I mm -hmm. realized my question was a bit too <laughs> layered and a little bit confused. <laughs> um, there's one moment where... Um, uh, you write, how could I conceive that Parchman was past, present, and future all mm -hmm. at once? Um, and this made me think, I mean, I th recently I saw the um, the Ava DuVernay documentary, mm -hmm. The 13th, about the prison industrial complex yep. in the United States. Mm -hmm. And one thing that that, um, that documentary tells so well is how sort of like there's a continuation mm -hmm. from the the bonds of slavery mm -hmm. to the way that the uh, the prison industrial complex is uh, conceived and mm -hmm. implemented mm -hmm. um, in the United States. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned in the introduction, there are a lot of, let's say, themes in mm -hmm. the book. So incarceration, mm -hmm. drug addiction, racism mm -hmm. and things like that, mm -hmm. which um, in a sense might make one think it's a, a state of the nation novel mm -hmm. or at least a state of a particular part of the nation mm -hmm. but as i was reading it i realized that could certainly be read in that case but also these these are just the kind of problems when you're in a sort of a, a situation particularly of poverty in mm -hmm. a particular uh part of society mm -hmm. these problems tend to mm -hmm. to intersect over you anyway so mm -hmm. it's not it's not just a case of um of the of, of sort of you just drawing on the themes that are present, but mm -hmm. actually sort of presenting something which is is actually quite actually quite realistic. True. I mean, I you know I I write about 
the kind of people who are members of my family. I write about the kind of people who are members of my community. Um, and, you know, uh, I, again, you know, I'm from this small, like, town um, on the coast of Mississippi, right? Um, the small poor community on the coast of Mississippi. And so I do, I do see, um, you know, the effects of, uh, you know, generational poverty all around me. I see, um, you know, pe many people in my community, many people in my family struggling with drug addiction, right? So, you know, since I am choosing to write about the people that I write about, I have to be honest about the circumstances of their of their lives. Um, I also think that um, I also think that unfortunately we're at this moment right now in the United States, and I'll just speak about the United States specifically, where um, where 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 a narrative is. Um, you know, this narrative is being pushed that the past does not matter and the past does not bear on the present and we're all equal and, you know, all of these injustices that you perceive are figments of your imagination. Um, and, you know, I mean, that. so that's this larger narrative, I think, that's being pushed right now. And so I... Um, you know, in my research, right, as I'm um, sort of learning more about the history of the United States, the history of the South, as I'm learning more about, you know, slavery and Jim Crow and, you know, and, 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 and lynching and, and, and then what came after, it's clearer to me with the, you know, the more that I read, the more that I learn that, that the past is the present, you know, and, and that, um, the, the past bears on the present very heavily, mm -hmm. right? In in very in, in in larger, you know, systemic ways, but also, you know, uh, you know, uh, very intimate, personal ways for many many people. Um, and so, I find myself returning to that idea again and again in mm -hmm. in in my in my work. Mm -hmm. There's one moment where. Um uh, somebody talks about pulling all of the weight of history mm -hmm. behind him, mm -hmm. and we we certainly get that sense. It's like there are certain there are certain people in society, certain characters who are obliged mm -hmm. to drag mm -hmm. the weight of history behind them, mm -hmm. and others because of um, who they are, about mm -hmm. how they're born, who, who are not. Yes, um, and and I, I suppose part of this narrative you talk about is. Uh, sort of perpetuated mm -hmm. by people who are, who are not obliged yep. to, to drag the weight of history um, behind them. Um, one of the... Um, well, I just, before I talk about that, actually, because I'm conscious there will be questions from the audience as well, uh, we did... Um, you did talk about the scene with the, uh, with the police mm -hmm. officer. Mm -hmm. um, and this is certainly is one of the most... Um, one of the most tense uh, scenes of the book, like it was really sort of uh, tense in a sort of very physically um, affecting way. And I can, as a reader, I can only imagine, as a writer, it must have been quite a, a traumatic experience mm -hmm. to commit to the page, was yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, but I, you know, as I said before, I, I felt a, I knew that it had to happen in the book mm -hmm. um, because it, I mean, it, it seemed true to, to, when I thought about who my characters were, mm -hmm. where they were from, um, when I thought about the place that shaped them, it had to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah, it had to happen. It it was difficult mm -hmm. to write. It was interesting because you know that's one of those moments. I'm I write. I don't plot everything out when I write. I don't know if I've communicated that to you yet, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't plot everything out when I write. I. I just go with the story, you know, I, I I just go with the characters and sometimes they do things that surprise me. Sometimes, you know, events happen that, you know, that I do not expect, you know, that, that I don't think, you know, that I don't expect, right? Um, so in that moment, it felt like the kind of moment where any where anything could happen, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I already had, Leone was already a narrator, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if Richie had narrated something at that point, but 
I had other narrators that I can draw from. Anything could have happened in that moment. Um, but, I, you know, I don't want to spoil it. Um, but I had to, something that was very tricky about that moment was making sure that the love that I feel for Jojo as a character and like that sense of like sympathy that I feel for him and a sense of protectiveness um, that I feel for him that that didn't get in the way mm-hmm. of, of 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 what was of in that scene right that that didn't you know intercede I guess mm-hmm. between him and the cop mm-hmm. um, so I don't know. I just, I mean, uh, I just had to figure it out as I as I went, I guess. And it felt um, when I was reading it as well. I was thinking of other um, sort of depictions of um, recent depictions of interactions between African Americans mm-hmm. and and police officers, mm-hmm. and thought it was interesting how I think in, in recent years. Um, the the image of the kind of the flashing blue light mm-hmm. sort of appearing, which I think at least to to certain sections of society would have o- often been a reassuring hmm. image. <laughs> and one of the things that's been fascinating, like I think of the scene uh, towards the end of Get Out, where mm-hmm. you see mm-hmm. the, the reaction the police a police light causes is yeah. so completely against what it would normally do in a in a film of that mm-hmm. kind, mm-hmm. and. And I just find that interesting that over the last few years, the experience of um, particularly African Americans and their experience with police has been uh, expressed more and has become mm-hmm. much more a part of the of the public consciousness. And it sort mm-hmm. of re- revealed a whole sort of wealth of experience, mm-hmm. which again was sort of prevented from from being told. In, yeah, in definitely. The past. I mean, and the question is, is whether or not anything will change now, right? I mean, I think that there are tons of artists and community activists and and even some, you know, lawmakers and politicians who would like to see that change. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I don't, I don't know if it will. I hope it will. It would be nice to um, to not feel to not to not feel as if your life is in danger every time you encounter the police. It would also be nice to not feel policed Mm -hmm. all the time. Um, You know, there have been times during my, um, in the life of my community, right, where sometimes the police are just, are very overbearing, Mm -hmm. right? They pull people over just to pull them over they um and then when people resist you know when they want to know why they've been pulled over then they threaten to arrest them sometimes they do arrest them and and it seems as if they are doing all these things and these are you know they're arresting like 50 year old mothers Mm -hmm. and their 30 year old daughters you know i mean so anyhow it makes you feel as if as if you are living in a police state um, and as if you know you don't have rights Mm -hmm. and um, and and something about that like living with that day in and day out Mm -hmm. is very traumatic Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear the final extract Mm -hmm. we talked about from from Richie so this is Richie um, and he is the ghost of a 13 year old boy who served time with Pop, Jojo's grandfather, in Parchman Prison Farm during the 1940s. And he, he and Pop, they were friends um, when they were in Parchman. As I said, Richie was 13, and Pop was around 15, I think, so not much older than Richie. I didn't. Un- Hold on, let me start again. <laughs> I didn't understand time either when I was young. How could I know that after I died, Parchman would pull me from the sky? How could I imagine Parchman would pull me to it and refuse to let go? And how could I conceive that Parchman was past, present, and future all at once? That the history and sentiment that carved the place out of the wilderness would show me that time is a vast ocean and that everything is happening at once. I was trapped, as trapped as I'd been in the room of pines where I woke up. Trapped as I was before the white snake, the black vulture, came for me. Parchman had imprisoned me again. I wandered the new prison night after night. 
It was a place bound by cinder blocks and cement. I watched the men fucking fight in the dark, so twisted up in each other I couldn't tell where one man ended and another began. I spent so many turns of the earth at the new parchment. I watched for the dark bird, but he was absent. I despaired, burrowed into the dirt, slept, and rose to witness the newborn parchman. I watched chain men clear the land and lay the first logs for the first barracks for gunmen and trusty shooters. I thought I was in a bad dream. I thought that if I burrowed and slept and woke again, I would be back in the new parchment. But instead, when I slept and woke, I was in the delta before the prison, and native men were ranging over that rich earth, hunting and taking breaks to play stickball and smoke. Bewildered, I burrowed and slept and woke to the new parchment again, to men who wore their hair long and braided to their scalps who sat for hours in small windowless rooms, staring at big black boxes that streamed dreams. Their faces in the blue light were stiff as corpses. I burrowed and slept and woke many times before I realized this was the nature of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. The final question I'm going to ask you just before opening up to the audience. Um, there's a moment where Jojo reflects um there's no happiness here um and it's true that in the in in that family there's um as we talked about there's a lot um there's a lot to be unhappy about there's also i think from from mom and pop so jojo's grandparents and from um kayla who his sister who we haven't had time really to talk about um there's also there's also a lot of love mm -hmm. as well in this family and even i mean even uh from uh, from Leonie and Michael in their um, in their own ways, um, and one of the things, one of the many things I think is very, uh, admirable about the book is that as it draws to a conclusion, you don't reach for easy mm -hmm. senses of hope, mm -hmm. uh, easy sort of conclusions that things are things mm -hmm. are going to be all right, mm -hmm. um, and yet at the same time, with Jojo at least as a reader. Mm -hmm. I, I have a certain confidence in mm -hmm. Jojo. At least, if Jojo was left to his own devices, mm -hmm. you know, if, and obviously there, in so many ways, things are stacked against mm -hmm. him. But that, that, that's where the hope mm -hmm. might lie. Is that something that you would feel? You feel also about? Yes, Jojo? I do. I definitely feel that about Jojo. I feel that about Jojo, and I feel that about Michaela. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of the reason that I feel that about Jojo and about Kayla is because I know that they have a reserve of love and caring and kindness to draw on that was sh shown to them and given to them by pop mm -hmm. and by ma'am i mean i think that that you know that those relationships you know between the grandparents right the the love that they share between the grandparents and the grandchildren between the siblings right between jojo and kayla i think that that um that 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 is sort of shoring them up mm. right shoring the, the 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 children up so that when they go out in the world right this world that um you know that continuously tries to sort of beat them down mm. right that that they'll be able to bear up underneath the things that they you know must survive um because they'll have that to to draw on mm. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I know that my in, my endings are not <laughs> are not uh, happy or or hopeful in a in an easy way. You, um, but I do feel like they're they're hopeful in, in that respect. Mm -hmm. Something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is trauma, mm -hmm. and um, and so I just you know I when I, when I write characters like Pop and Jojo um, and, and Kayla and, and Ma'am. Um, and, e and even Richie and Leone, I feel like it's it's important for me to develop them as well as I can um, to to make them as complicated and as human as I can on the page, because I believe that we are more than our trauma, mm -hmm. and, and 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 I think that um, you know that maybe in the wider conversation, you know, in the media, in in some books in the past we've been just reduced to our, to our trauma again and again and again. And I think that makes it harder for people outside of our communities and outside, you know, uh, people outside of us to see us as full, you know, mm -hmm. fully, you know, 
you know, concrete, complicated human beings. And, um, and so I feel like it's part of my job to write in a way so that the reader understands that and understands we're more than our drama and just understands that we, you know, experience, you know, joy and, 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 and exhibit tenderness and exhibit kindness, um, you know, just like any other human being would. So, so, so that's, I definitely think about all of those things as I'm, you know, while I'm writing a first draft, while I'm revising, I mean, throughout the entire um, process. Thank you. If you have a question for Jasmine Ward, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you because there are people all around the shop and outside. So it would be uh, good if everyone can hear you. Who would like to, to get... Oh, there's one. Okay. Uh, okay, there's one just at the back here and then we'll come down to this gentleman there. If the person can step forward as well so Jasmine can see you, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, my question is about unlikable women. Mm -hmm. And if you thought about how to write Leone in a way that she was more likable or mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that? No, that's a good question. Um, Leone was one of the most difficult characters that I've ever written. Um, one of the reasons that she was so difficult was because she it was because she is unlikable but she's unlikable in a way that I struggled with right because she abuses and neglects her children and that was really hard for me to um to deal with as I you know as I was working on the rough draft of the book the beginning of the rough draft of the book and she was so unlikable unlikable that it you know that it um that it struck me and I thought now normally I love my characters but I don't love this character I don't even like this character and that was problematic um, because I didn't want to make her into a villain right um, I, I wanted you know I, I, I feel I think it's good to write an unlikable character as long as the reader um, the reader can dislike a character, but I think that the reader still needs to feel something for that character, right? Something besides dislike. The, the reader needs, I think that relationship needs to be complicated, right? Um, so I tried to figure, so I paused for a second, and I tried to figure out exactly why she does what she does. Like, why she abuses her children and neglects her, neglects her children. And that's when I figured everything out about Given. Right, and I figured, I figured out that she was sort of still suffering, you know, and 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 dragging her grief with her, and dragging her pain with her, and because, unfortunately, her character flaw is that she can't sit with pain, so therefore she can't learn how to live with it, so therefore she's always running from it and dragging it behind her, and it's, you know, and, and it's stunting her growth, right? And once I understood that, then I felt real sympathy for her, you know, and then. Um, I, I, you know, then then her story became more heartbreaking, right? When I realized that she knows that she's neglecting her children and she's not being the best mother, and she yearns for the like love and approval and affection, but she, but because she is who she is, she can't change her behavior, you know, to, I don't know, to to provide for them, to be a better better mother to them, and to you know her. Mo to be a better person to her, her mother and 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 her father and the people around her. So, um, so yeah. So I mean, I like I said, I I, I like, you know, I, I I enjoy an unlikable character, but it's very important to me to comp to complicate those characters, so that the reader feels something else for them besides just distaste. There was a gentleman just there, and then we'll come to you. Hi. When you're writing uh, first-person narratives from with multiple characters, what's the process like in in your creative practice of shifting between those different narrators and shifting between those different voices? How do you kind of negotiate around that? It, it can be a little jarring, right? Especially when you know the chap the chapter that you were working on beforehand. You know, the chapter that comes before is not. Uh, written from the perspective, you know, of the of the person who is like narrating the chapter that you're currently on. Um, generally, I just I I skip 
before I write the beginning, you know, of the new chapter from the new perspective, I'll go back to the chapter that come that is from that character's point of view, you know, that came before. So I'll skip forward, you know, or um, you know, one chapter or two chapters, however far I need to go, and then just read it so I can get a good sense of where that character was when we left him or her, right? Where that character was, what they knew in that moment, um, or, or how they had sort of changed, or, you know, um, it, you know, in, 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 in the, you know, previous chapter, um, you know, how they had grown. Um, and so then I can sort of carry that knowledge forward with me into the current chapter that I'm working on. But it's definitely, I mean, ideally, if you're, you know, writing a book that has multiple first-person perspectives, all those first-person perspectives will be distinct and different. And, you know, the prose will differ so much in each one that you'll be able to tell, uh, you, know, you know, that that this is that character speaking, right? Um, or that you're, you know, or that this is that, you know, that character's uh, experience. And so, um, so yeah, so I just, I, I, you know, I, I went back and I cheated a bit <laughs> and sort of used, um, you know, the characters, uh, previous chapters to help me through, you know, each, ch each chapter as I was writing it and also to make me aware of the way that they have used, that they're using language throughout the book, right? Um, and also remind me of what their experiences have been, right? And what they're bringing to, you know, the story and what they're bringing to the present moment. Um, all, doing all of that, I mean, it, it it makes it makes for slower, for a slower pace, I guess, uh, when you're writing. But I think, I think that's the one of the most manageable ways uh, to do it because you also have to be aware of like what this character has revealed, and whether or not the things they have revealed are true or just something that they mistakenly believe, and how those things will affect the other characters and you know how other characters might look at the same situation and believe different things or know different things so it can get a little complicated so that's the easiest way to do it is just you know go back to the last chapter refresh yourself and just you know i guess try to keep all of that together in your head as you're diving into their current uh you know bit i guess there's this lady just stand up look up Hi. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the character of Michael mm -hmm. and the biracial mm -hmm. um, situation. Mm -hmm. I found Michael a bit an interesting character because in a way he's a peripheral character mm -hmm. and yet so much about him and what he's done and what's happened is integral to mm -hmm. everything that's happening now. Mm -hmm. And he's also a tortured character. Mm -hmm. I was also surprised at first that he was white. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. He's um he's an interest Michael is an interesting character. I mean I know that I that he didn't perhaps he wasn't as present as the other characters. He didn't get as much time as the other characters did. Um I think in part that um the reason that that is the case is because um because I was afraid of you know I was I guess I was afraid of sort of uh writing into a tangent right i was thinking about my pacing right um in the book uh and i also think that he's perhaps less developed as a character because he doesn't speak right he doesn't get his own section so therefore he is filtered through leone and and what she feels for him and how she sees him right and what she yeah and 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 uh you know, and, and what she knows of him. And then he's also filtered through his son, you know, through Jojo. And what Jojo knows of him, um, what Jojo thinks about him, um, you know, how Jojo perceives him. And so I think that um, that, that can, make it, they can make it a bit difficult, I guess, to sort of, for the reader to figure out who he is. But it was important to me that, you know, Jojo... Jojo is a uh, uh, an observant boy. He's really perceptive too, but 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 he only knows so much about Michael because he is thirteen. He's still a child, right? Leone knows much more about Michael, so it was really important to me in, that in her sections, 
that she gives us more background about who he was, you know, and why she fell in love with him and, you know, what he struggled with, um, you know, in, in, in his life. I mean, we, we never get any sort of any verbatim conversations about race necessarily right or about or we'd never get any verbatim conversations um detailing his father's reaction you know to him coming home and saying leonia and i are having a child or what it what his mother might say or other people in his family right um we never get any of that but i imagine that it must have been difficult for for him to navigate those two worlds and to try to bring them together in some respects um and and that he's sort of struggling in a very intimate way right <laughs> with this specter of race and racism um so yes yeah, so, i mean he was an interesting character uh character to write but again it was important for me that for him to have some texture you know what i'm saying for him to um to have some sort of depth and to be a, you know for him to have his own conflicts maybe that he's sort of working through hi i'm just curious about um this the whole notion of characters and inhabiting or yeah inhabiting these characters mm. i wonder how easily do you shake them off or how long do they stay with you because i can imagine that's really intense and it can stay with you a long time mm -hmm. that's a really good que good question um i mean i th in some way i think that all of them are still with me i feel like each character that i write about sort of stays but i but i can also say that when i get to the end of a draft when i get to the end of the rough draft when i finish the rough draft and then when i finish the final big revision right and as y'all heard i go through you know i revise multiple times and so when i finish like the 16th revision or something right the big revision i'm always emotional because it feels like a loss at that moment because i have to leave these characters who i've spent so much time with and who i've come to really care for and who become re who are real to me um so yeah so sometimes it can be a little difficult to sort of surface out of that fictional world and then you know walk in the real the real world how long did that take sorry the writing yeah. um let's see uh took longer than you think. The reason why it took longer than you think <laughs> is because I began writing about JoJo in around 2009. Oh, wow. And I, so I was writing bad first chapters of a novel <laughs> where JoJo was the main character and except Leone was not his mother. He had a different mother. He had a white mom. He had multiple siblings. And he was sort of wandering around this post-apocalyptic landscape in the in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Just because I just wanted to write a post-apocalyptic book, right? And I thought, <laughs> well, that's perfect. Um, but it, I couldn't get it to work. It just didn't. I couldn't I wrote bad first chapter after bad first chapter after bad first chapter and it was so bad that I just had to stop <laughs> and I and I put the idea away I just you know I told Jojo he had to chill out for a minute and then I wrote my memoir and and it was only you know after I wrote my memoir and after that was published and it, and it, that I decided to go back to Jojo and really try to tell his story and and really figure out what that was because there's something about him that that drew me right and that obsessed me i just couldn't figure out his circumstances i couldn't figure out you know i couldn't figure out why and so so i returned to the book and uh and i and i really i just 
I, I thought about everything, right? I, I tried, I figured out exactly like who Leone was, right? I figured out who Pop was. I figured out who Ma'am was. I mean, in, in a rough way, but still, um, you know, I figured out who Kayla was. I figured out who Michael was. And so once I had the right players, I think I just had to get the right people around him, right? The, his true family members. Once I figured out who they were, then I was able to write a good first chapter. Um, and... And so yeah, so it it took it took longer than you, you know, it took like eight years, I guess, to really get it together. <laughs> I think we have a final question. There was a lady just here. Hi, um, I really like the way that in all of your books you kind of the same characters keep coming up again, like Big Henry keeps showing mm -hmm. up. I was just wondering if from when you started writing, you always knew that you were going to write about Bois Sauvage, or whether that happened kind of not by accident, but. Um, I think that I did. I mean, you know, in Where the Line Bleeds is my first novel, and that novel is set in Bois Sauvage. But before I wrote that novel, I was working on lots of short stories. And like I said, some of them have been published, and some of them, many of them, have not. But it, but those stories all took place in Bois Sauvage too. So I mean, I was, I think I was fairly committed to remaining in that place because I'm writing about the people that I write about, right? And Bois Sauvage is sort of, uh, I think it's the fictional counterpart of my actual hometown, DeLille. Um, and so, and because I'm committed to writing about, you know, like I said, the kind of people who could be members of my family or the kind of people who could be people in, who live in my community, therefore I'm committed to you know, staying in uh, Bois Sauvage. Although, in my next my next two novels will not be set in Bois Sauvage. Um, I am working on a novel set in New Orleans during the height of the domestic slave trade. So, in the early 1800s. And so, of course, that doesn't take place in Bois Sauvage. Um, and then I'm also, very soon, I will be working on a book for young people, like a middle grade slash YA book. I plan it, I intend to work on both of these at the same time. And, I, and that one will not be set in Bois Sauvage, I don't think. So I'm, I'm moving a bit further afield, but, but because I'm committed to writing about the kind of people that I write about, I think that I will probably end up returning there or near there um, in the future. But who knows? I'm, I'm trying to cast about for like for for the the novel that will come after these <laughs> two novels because I'm anxious and I always I need something on the horizon at all time, right? Um, so I'm casting about for ideas right now. So I might return in that one. I, I don't I don't I don't know. Hopefully, a, a, a character will pop into my head soon. Well, I hope you'll come back to speak with us about all three of I those. I would love to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is all we've got time for tonight. Um, please do stick around, though. We will be serving wine. Uh, we have plenty of copies of Sing Unburied Sing and also Jasmine's previous novels and her memoir and um, The Fire This Time, the collection of, uh, of essays that Jasmine edited. They're all available at the till. Uh, I'm sure Jasmine will be happy to sign your books uh, once you've bought them. Uh, otherwise, please just join me one more time in saying thank you to Jasmine Ward. Mm.